Now that tax season is finally over, how does earning 36 CPE credits sound? What about hanging out with James Corden, Andrew Zimmern, and some of the stars of Hamilton? Why not do both at Synergy 2020? Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor later in the episode. So there's one more piece of data that's important for our listeners. Some 61% of the businesses admit to needing more practical advice and tools to weather the storm. These include support, by the way, of training or consulting. So there you go. They, they want our help. Small businesses want accountants' help to get through the pandemic. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by ClockChart. Now more than ever, your clients with teams in the field are looking to reduce contact and automate their manual paperwork processes. The team at ClockChart has been busy scrambling to keep up with demand by helping accountants move clients from frustrating paper timesheets to their much-loved mobile time tracking app. Even with this increased demand, ClockChart continues to provide fast and delightful support. They're actively working with accountants and bookkeepers to implement product feedback and improvements to their already robust app that includes features like crew tracking, scheduling, overtime notifications, routes, geofencing, locations, job costing, budgeting, and reporting. To try the timesheet app that's taken over the title for best customer support, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash clockchart. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-L-O-C-K-S-H-A-R-K. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by OnPay. OnPay is a top-rated payroll app that is the right fit for all your clients, whether they have just one or 500 employees. OnPay brings everything together in the cloud and can handle all the complicated stuff like agricultural payrolls, Form 943, multi-state, and H-2A visas. OnPay even makes it easy to switch from other payroll services by doing all the data entry for each client account that you set up. Right now, Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners can get three free months of OnPay payroll services. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash OnPay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-N-P-A-Y. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. David, is this something that's just an Arizona thing or is this new for this election? Because I'm getting dozens of text messages, it feels like, every week. I get multiple per day. Dozens a day, right? I get them from Democratic groups. I get them from Republican groups. Although I can't actually tell what group it's from because it's just a number. And then it'll be a video or an image. I, mean, I got one that supposedly was from the Arizona GOP, Republican Party, with like a picture of like fires basically saying like, you know, vote for Republicans or the country's going to burn down. I mean, just really extreme stuff. I I think it was, it started the election two years ago and it's really full force this year. And and I've seen friends on Facebook, everybody's complaining about, I don't necessarily know if it's specific to Arizona, but Arizona is a huge battleground state, right? Right. It could tip blue this year, but you're right. Like it's at least an email, your your email program will just push a lot of that stuff into spam. Right. (laughs) There's no spam filter for text messages. And and I can't even report it as spam. All I can do is I'm worried that if I reply and I say stop, that they'll just send me more from a different number or something. So it's like, I'm not sure if I should just delete it or reply and say stop. I, I, I was reading this article on MIT Technology Review that said that this is a big problem. It's not just you and me in Arizona. The U.S., People in the U.S. are going to have received almost 3 billion political text messages by Tuesday, Election Day. And there's only 234 million eligible voters. So 3 billion messages spread across 234 million eligible voters is like, what, like more than 10 each or something? I mean, it's a lot, right? I imagine it's cheap, right? Like from a execution standpoint versus a TV ad or something, this is probably a very cheap way to... And then on top of that, you still read the message. Even right. though you're trying to eliminate it, it's so small, your brain just reads it. So mm-hmm. the exposure, it's probably super effective. And oh, that's yeah. why they do it. Pops up on your lock screen. Right? You don't even get to choose yeah, exactly. whether or not you read it. It's you're there. driving the car, it just shows up yeah. and at the next stoplight. You're like, oh. And, and the article says that that's true, that they are opened anywhere from 70 to 98% of the time, which is obviously significantly higher than email open rates, which, I mean, a good email open rate is like 20%. 30%. That's a really good one. And, you know, it's often way lower, you know, in the single digits. So apparently they're allowed to do this. There's a loophole 
with the Federal Election Commission so that when you send a text message, you don't have to include those with typical political disclosures. You don't have to attach them to an identity. It's really just a Wild West. Uh, and there's all these apps now that let you send mass text messages very easily. I'm bringing this up because it's a pain point for me, but I'm also thinking, hey, there's a lesson here for accountants, which is let's figure out using these apps that obviously the political organizations have figured out how to use, let's start texting our prospects and our customers because they actually read those. Right? If you're trying to get information from a client to complete a tax return, if you text them, they're going to open that and they're going to respond to it. They can even take a picture and send it back to you. And I know there's tools out there that do this, that allow firms, just like political organizations, to send mass text messages, individualized, respond to them. It's like a support inbox kind of thing. Uh, that, that's where I would be putting my money if I wanted to be on the cutting edge of practice management. I can see like I actually texted with uh, one of my children's teacher, one of their teachers, and it's super convenient. Oh, yeah. Of course, my son forgot the name of the book he was supposed to read. <laughs> so and then, and then he asked in a Zoom and he still forgot the name of the book. So I just texted her and she said, the name of the book, it was easy. It was super convenient. And I think it's a good, it's a good experience from the customer or the client's point of view. Now, if this teacher has 30 parents texting her, that's not good. So I think as you as an accounting firm owner, if you're going to have your clients text with you, you better figure out a way to manage that internally. Yeah. Don't use your personal number, obviously. Use a service. And there actually are services now for teachers. And maybe that teacher is even using it. I just read about it. I can't remember the name, but it basically allows a teacher to get a number where they can text with the parents and it's secure, it's monitored, the schools can subscribe to it and make sure that funny business isn't happening. This exists. I saw an app uh, at the Clio Law Firm conference a few years back, and they had a service like this for lawyers to enable their clients to text with them. And I actually hit them up then. I was like, you should build this. Like accountants should have something like this, but they never jumped into our space. So there's there's a market there. Somebody could yeah. build this just for accounting firms only. Um, and, I, and I don't necessarily know if... Um, uh, Lysio does it. Lysio sponsored before because I think Lysio, the whole point is for people to stay inside their app. I don't know if it, if it does text or not. Well, yeah, like you said, there's a huge opportunity for practice management solutions to integrate text messaging in addition to email because this is where it's headed. The email inbox is overloaded. If you want to actually get information, if you want to book that meeting with a prospect, you need to be in their texts. And yeah, eventually there will be some spam filters and you know, we'll have to deal with that, but that's going to take a while to happen, right? So you know, let's take advantage of the situation. The annoyance of political messages is actually pointing to an opportunity here. So I have another opportunity for accounts and bookkeepers. What's that, David? Uh, it is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Oh. And security.org uh, ran their annual report. On, they asked 750 Americans about their password strategies. <laughs> Uh-oh. I bet it's pretty bad, right? 14% of Americans are using the word COVID in their passwords. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. 12% are using the word Trump. 9% are using the word Biden in their passwords. Oh, God. 16% are still using either their pet's name or their birth years. I saw a funny comic on Facebook where it's like a, a dad and his son and there's a the son has a new puppy. And the dad says, think carefully about what you'd like to name him. Because you'll be using him as your security question answer for the rest of your life. Actually, that would be pretty funny if somebody last pass for April Fools created a dog naming app, right? That would yeah. create like these random, random generated names. You like that's your that's your dog's name. It should be called this. Really, if council bookkeepers sit down, have a conversation with your clients. Like this is so it's so important not to do this, and it's it it's. It's an epidemic, yeah. really, the, the amount of bad passwords people are currently using. If I were still in practice, I would have a service offering in my firm that's you know, security consulting, very simple. It's like not even complicated. I would just ask my clients, do you have a password management system in your business? If not, I would offer to implement LastPass or 1Password for all of their employees. That and two-factor. Like, yeah. like so, so this is like simple tech service you can provide to your clients and it takes zero skill not, not zero skills but like you don't have to learn a lot you're not you're not a, you're not a cyber crime expert but if yeah. you can just do those two things for your client you protect them so much if you can implement expensify you can implement lastpass yeah right. oh and i mentioned expensify so i guess we should talk about that so i wrote an op-ed in accounting today basically talking about the same things that we we talked about on our last episode and i've been following the news of course about Expensify and the email, and, and it's it's turned into a broader story. There are other startups on both sides of this sort of issue. Do we get politically involved? Do we not get politically involved? And I was particularly interested 
by what happened at Coinbase, a fintech company that specializes in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So apparently the CEO at, at Coinbase did the opposite of what David did and said, you are not allowed to have political conversations at work. And I don't want any of our employees engaging in political conversations online. And if you do, then you can leave. So he, he's taking that. Like, Didn't some like 30% of his company le left though, right? It was 5% of oh, the 5 employees. Okay. Yeah. And this was all in response to a walkout that employees staged due to the company's lack of response to the Black Lives Matter movement. Like the company didn't want to do anything. Company employees walked out. CEO responded saying, if you want to have political opinions, don't work here. And then 5% of the employees left. So I, mean, I just want, that was a different uh, point of view, right? A different Yeah, it's because of the opposite thing. Yeah, right? the opposite yeah. approach, basically. So I also mentioned last week that I was going to be on the Expensify podcast. Prior to that episode, our episode publishing, I got a email saying that that has been pushed out because... David Barrett had interviews with the New York Times and Reuters scheduled. You got trumped. <laughs> I got. <laughs> they, they just, like, they, you're not important enough. Like, yeah, sorry. I, I started to feel a little bit, you know, uh, offended. But then I realized, you know, it's New York Times, it's Reuters. Uh, so that is scheduled now for sometime after the election, assuming that my op-ed doesn't offend Expensify so much that they just drop me entirely. Which I, I hope not, because I would love to have a good, friendly conversation. Uh, with David Barrett about what happened and, you know, get the full story from the accountant perspective. Because I feel like that's missing in the mainstream press. Oh, yeah. They're not going to talk about that part of it. The mainstream press is going to cover whatever's going to get them the most ratings. That's right. right. So they're going to they're gonna spin the opposite side just to get, you know, people fired up about it. But enough about Expensify. Yeah. I, I would love to talk with you about the latest with the stimulus and PPP and EIDL because we didn't really get to that last week. And there's some big news about those PPP applications uh, and the whole forgiveness process. So is it necessary that we talk about this on the show? I think it Come is on. necessary. I think, I think economic uncertainty makes it necessary that we speak about PPP on the show. All right. Here we go. So um, this week, SBA is pressing the big businesses. So they're going after you know the businesses that took $2 million loans or more. And remember, midsummer. The Treasury said they were going to investigate these companies, right? Yes. I mean, going back, there was like strong, strong negative reaction on in the public to these big companies like Shake Shack getting these loans. There were like- Rich Chris Steakhouse. Yeah. That's, that's well, the photo they used on the article, Rich Chris Steakhouse. Wall Street firms getting them, uh, you know, where people are paid millions of dollars. Uh, so yeah, there was like all this political fallout. And then the Treasury, the SBA were like, oh- this can't possibly be right. We're going to investigate these. And then- And both sides of the aisle were, were yeah. screaming for investigations. Well, this SBA this week started to circulate a PDF, loan necessity questionnaires. And it's nine pages long. And there's all sorts of questions on here. Quarterly revenue, capital expenditures, dividend payments, whether any employees earned more than a quarter million dollars. And- I don't think any of that was originally on the PPP loan applications in the first place, right? I don't think so. And I'm looking at this and there's so much data in this that it's asking for. Now, this is the SBA, but I'm wondering, will, will this be reconciled against tax returns and answers you give the IRS and then maybe answers you did on your application? And this application here, this forgiveness, um, this, what's it's called? This is not forgiveness. This is called... Necessity, what's it? Let me scroll You said back something up. like loan necessity application. So, yes, loan necessity questionnaire. Questionnaire. So it seems like, obviously, the point of this, it's, it, it's on the form. The purpose of the questionnaire, the SBA says, is to review the loans to, quote, maximize program integrity and protect taxpayer resources. The information, quote, will be used to inform SBA's review of your good faith certification that economic uncertainty made your loan request necessary to support your ongoing operations, unquote. So for those loans over $2 million, it looks like the SBA is going to really be going after people to challenge the necessity, good faith certification. Failure to complete the form may cause the SBA to determine that your loan was ineligible. Man. So Eric S. Gearson of the ASCPA He's quoted in a Politico article saying that borrowers didn't anticipate these questions when they applied for loans. They didn't think that this was going to happen. It seems sort of like a bait and switch. He said, quote, there's going to be a lot of feelings that this is not fair, unquote. 
So is this going to be a gotcha kind of program? Are we going to see more of this gotcha mentality, these loan forgiveness getting denied for the big loans? Now, admittedly, it's only over $2 million, but still, it doesn't seem like, personally to me, not exactly the best way to to go about this. And then here's the crazy part as far as like, there's a lot of risk with this because you're going to fill this out. You're, 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 you're. You're a huge company. You're in your county department. Fill that out. They're going to turn it. You're they're, you're going to turn over your bank. The bank data entries it into the SBA system. <laughs> yeah, that's going to go great. And so, and and my thing is that I just feel like it's um, there's so many questions on here, and you filled out the loan app. Now you're filling out all these questions here, and you've probably filed returns. All it's going to take is one mistake, and then are you just going to be accused for, for fraud? Yeah, and are you going to be accused of lying to the federal government, right? There can be strict penalties for that sort of thing. So uh, I wouldn't want to be in that situation. I'm glad I'm not. But let's talk about another program, David, the Main Street Lending Program, which we haven't talked about much on our show because it's for much larger companies than the PPP. Yeah, I think this. So this is where the the Federal Reserve Board, you can take a loan right from the Federal Reserve Board themselves, and yep. it was really geared towards... They call that Main Street lending, but it was really much bigger businesses, like $500,000 or something was the start of these loans, right? Yeah. And they keep lowering the amount of the loans because people don't want them. Part of the problem is that there's no forgiveness for these loans. So a lot of businesses don't want more debt. So they've lowered the minimum loan size for these down from 250000 to to 100000 and they are eliminating the or easing the restrictions on debt for companies that are already participating in the Paycheck Protection Program. So like previously, if you had a PPP loan, that would count against you for getting one of these Main Street Lending Program loans. So they're doing something to try and make it a little easier for people to get these loans. But again, there's no forgiveness for those ones. You're going to pay interest on those until those are forgiven. But this is a way for the, the Fed to put money into the economy and bypass the banks. Yes, bypass the banks um, and directly inject stimulus. But you know they haven't really been that successful with this. So far, with any, it of feels that slow. It feels very, very slow the way the rollout on this is. But I guess it probably have to tip to a little with a little bit more caution because the the numbers in this are much bigger. Yep. Right. Yep. That so they're dealing with. So and, want, and the people that need this loan probably don't need it as fast. Right. 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 Uh, so how about we talk about accounting jobs in the economy? Um, I've got Before some... we jump there, let's talk about the emergency loans from the SBA. Okay. You know the emergency ten thousand dollar. EIDL loans that SBA was doing. Yes. So remember, it was very slow at first. Nobody was getting them. And then out of nowhere, they just started pumping out, approving everybody. And word got out apparently on the street. And we never heard about this while this was going on. So there's this is a long form article on Bloomberg. So word got out on the street that if you can just say you have a business with 10 employees, within a few days, they just gave you 10 grand. Yeah. Oh, this was the grant portion of the EID. The grant, loans, the yeah. grant portion. And so what's happening is in the neighborhoods in Chicago and Miami, people were on social media. Everybody was just doing this. Um, and then you had your professional thieves like in Russia and Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Essentially what happened was because they, they hired all these temp employees and nobody cared and there was no fraud and there was this pressure to get this money approved and get it out the door. Um, so they interviewed a lot of like front end workers that were at the SBA at the time that were hired temporarily for five, six weeks. And then outside fraud investigators that worked maybe for credit unions and things like that. And then thousands of social media postings they saw. Remember they worked with um, Quicken Loans. They worked with the Quicken Loans yep. and they used their, their rapid decision processing tools. Well, that system was designed to run fraud checks, but it had no way to check if it was actually a business. So they could check if you were a real person. They could check if you had a real bank account that the money was going to go to, check if there was a proper internet address tied to it. But the system was never built to see if you were a real business. And so you were seeing ridiculous applications come through where one company would show up again and again and again with exactly 10 employees and only $24,000 in annual revenue. And then they would get the uh, $10,000. There's a guy uh, who ran a credit union. So he's an investigator, fraud investigator at the credit union. And they said that somebody showed up at a drive through window trying to withdraw $10,000 of cash that he just received $32,000 into a brand new account. So basically set it up, got the deposit, showed up like the very afternoon to the drive through and said, I really think, and just withdrew, withdrew $10,000 cash. And they were putting loans into people's personal accounts. An 18 year old who got 49,000 couldn't show that she actually owned a hairdressing business. Others freely admitted that they didn't have a business and they still got the money. So I'm reading an NPR story that's like about this same idea, the EIDL fraud. 
according to the SBA's inspector general, up to $78 billion in program applications were potentially fraudulent or for ineligible applicants. And they have some similarly crazy examples. There was a set of 10 loans for 10 different bathroom renovation companies in the same city. The email address for all of those were for a burrito restaurant. And those restaurant or those bathroom renovation companies didn't exist, but the burrito restaurant did. So did the burrito restaurant owner get 10 fraudulent loans? Like you said, it sounds like they didn't really have a way to vet this. And there's another detail in this article related to what you said, that the loan officers only had 15 minutes per application to process them. 15 minutes to process each application. Do you think they're really doing a bunch of vetting on that? Well, even on this article talks about how even if they did escalate one up, they were just told, do your job and kick more out. And there's uh, in this article talks about how some in Chicago, like these are residential buildings, word would get out and every single person that lives in that building on every single floor, word would get out and they would all get a loan. They'd all teach each other how to do it. And so there's wow. like massive frauds. And then, so they were looking at it by like con- congressional districts and the number of people um, in some of these districts in Illinois, one of the districts. Mm-hmm. So basically somebody counted, here's how many businesses are here in this district. The number of eligible recipients that actually took out loans was 12x the number of businesses there. <laughs> wow. Like this is massive fraud on yeah, the $10,000 R1. Massive, massive frauds. And going back to what you said about this burrito place, there's a small business owner. They haven't had a business in years and people were creating phony applications under this person's business and he was getting investigated. So it's an interesting article to uh, touch on and look at. Now, the, the this is a real concerning part though. So the SBA on Wednesday said that they referred 80,000 of these loans over for criminal investigation. There's no way they're going to be able to investigate 80,000 loans. Yeah. So remember that the Department of Justice has announced only charges against like 23 people. Yeah. All of them were with the PPP program. The only one that's been busted for this $10,000 grant was a um, a protester, a rioter, who they didn't know. He, the, the way they caught him, he cut the brake lines on a police van and they caught him doing that. And they were looking at his phone and then they discovered he falsified and took out a $10,000 grant. So they pretty much have caught nobody for this. 80,000 people may have done it and they've caught and they've, they've busted nobody. Well, I guess if we want to look on the bright side of things, at least that money is making it out into the economy, unlike some of these other programs, which nobody's using. And then this ties right back to, we can get into app news and, and you know the new banks, but they, they stopped eventually letting people set these accounts up with Chime or Green Dot or any of these instant online banks you set up with your phone because it's usually an indication of fraud. Oh my gosh. Well, one last fraud story to cap things off. This is actually a success story. The SEC has awarded a record $114 million to a whistleblower. I think we're in the wrong line of work, David. I think we need to become professional whistleblowers or something. Because if you are at a company and you blow the whistle to the SEC, if you give them credible information, if the SEC then takes a successful enforcement action against that company, you can earn up to a 10 to 30% commission of the fine collected if it exceeds a million dollars. And so that's how this happened. Uh, it must have been a really big fine. They don't release the information on the company or the individual or the amount you know, of the fine, uh, but they do release these press releases about the whistleblower awards to encourage people to come forward. Uh, and since This program started in 2012. The SEC has awarded approximately $676 million to 108 individuals. All of the awards, by the way, are not funded by taxpayer dollars. They are funded by fines paid by companies for violating SEC rules. So, wow. Pretty cool program, right? Like, it's a lot of money. Yeah. So, the whistleblowers get the money because obviously they're never going to get jobs again in corporate finance or accounting. Uh, It keeps businesses accountable. And prevents you know frauds from going on longer than they do. So you said you had some economic news about jobs and for accountants. Yeah. So you know uh, we we've reported in addition to the overall economy, we like to focus on how is the economy going for accountants. We talked in the past about how there have been some significant layoffs, although not nearly as bad in the accounting profession as in the economy as a whole. We tend to be insulated from that. And now we have some data courtesy of. ADECO, A-D-E-C-C-O, 
which runs accounting principles. They pulled over a thousand hiring decision makers and managers, and we've got some data on you know what they intend to do about accounting jobs. Nearly 70% of organizations that furloughed or laid off employees plan to backfill those positions. 70% of organizations that fired people are going to backfill those. Now that's overall. What about accounting and finance? Nearly half of respondents in accounting and finance indicate that their department would definitely backfill roles that were eliminated. So it's looking like we're going to replace about half the jobs that were eliminated. 80 6% of general respondents said they plan to backfill those roles in less than a year, and 61% plan to do it in less than six months. In accounting and finance, half, about half, plan to do that within four to six months. And then 32% plan to do it sometime between seven and 11 months. So that's that's based on what hiring managers are saying they're planning to do. And backfilling, by the way, doesn't mean that you're going to hire back the people you let go. It means you're going to hire new people to replace them. That's interesting that the, the, those numbers on that. And then did you see uh, Going Concern had an article um, and it was basically their number of the day and it was 75%. And w- what does that mean? Apparently the AICPA uh, had an, an, ar- an article or a draft PDF in 2015 talking about retired CPAs. They were kind of thinking about having a retired CPA status. Oh. Kind of like there's currently an inactive CPA status yep. because in 2015, they estimated that 75% of its members, the AICPA members, will be eligible to retire by 2020. Well, 2020 is here. 75% of the members are eligible to retire. So, so how, in other what's words- What's the impact as far as jobs and backfilling this for the next 15 years as these people get out of the space? So what you're telling me is that CPAs are old. If 75% are eligible for retirement, that means that a lot of CPAs are- getting up there in years. And yeah. we're not we're not generating a new enough new CPAs to take their place. Or maybe we are and they're just not joining the AICPA? Oh, that could be it too. Interesting. I'm curious. Yeah, I'd be I'd be curious to to know uh how their membership is doing over time. So I do have some economic news for small business that's uh encouraging. Okay, let's hear it. So this is a survey from Capital One that came out. And so 57% of small business owners say their financial position is either the same or better than pre-pandemic. What percentage? Uh, 57%. Wow. So more than half are better off or the same. And four out of five uh, who received the PPP loan believe specifically that that helped them during the pandemic and helped them stay in business for the long term. So people who did get the PPP loan definitely feel like it helped them. Only 2% of the business owners report having permanently closed since the onset of the pandemic. Food services, construction, and technology businesses were the hardest hit. I just I, I just thought 2% was very low. Well, maybe the businesses that have closed still hope to reopen. I mean, a lot of the impact is still to come. I mean, if you're behind on your rent payments, you know, it's the same situation we have with renters, for instance, overall, where a lot of people are behind. Are they going to get evicted? That process can take a long time. So m- many of the impact of the of the recession caused by the pandemic could still be to come. And especially if we have to lock down, I think uh, England just announced they're was, locking down for four weeks, right? I've been reading this over the weekend. France, Germany, the UK, Belgium. I really hope it doesn't happen here. At least in Europe, they're keeping the schools open now. So it's not like they're closing the schools and I just, mean, just small businesses. Yeah. <laughs> just small. <laughs> selfishly, yeah. selfishly as somebody who can work remotely and work from home, like I'm more concerned about the schools. I, I'm obviously also concerned about the small businesses and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens after the election. If there is a national mask mandate or lockdown, I really doubt there will be, but uh, you know, we'll see. So there's one more piece of data that's important for our listeners. Some 61% of the businesses admit to needing more practical advice and tools to weather the storm. These include support, by the way, of training or consulting. So there you go. They they want our help. Small businesses want accountants' help to get through the pandemic. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Thomson Reuters. The Thomson Reuters Synergy User Conference 2020 for tax and accounting firms is now virtual and happening on November 10th to the 13th, 2020. 
During the four days of interactive learning, you'll explore the future of tax and accounting and how the industry is accelerating the adoption of cloud accounting, cloud audit, virtual offices, remote work, AI, and client communications. I brought some of the over 100 sessions available at Synergy. These are some that caught my eye and I think you'd find interesting. Increase advisory and maintenance revenue with marketing, how to run a virtual meeting, Microsoft Teams for accounting professionals, cloud security, the contactless tax return, remote auditing. To join 100 plus experts and speakers and over 3,000 attendees at Synergy 2020 to share your expertise, energize your connections, and empower your circle of influence, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash synergy. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash S-Y-N-E-R-G-Y. And did I mention that James Corden is hosting? Well, I mentioned remote work, David. Let's talk about some data coming out of surveys about remote work. Is it working? Is it not working? Are people moving? There's been a lot of talk about people relocating. I relocated from California to Arizona to get more space to get out of my apartment and buy a house out here. Many companies are now hiring staff remotely or working with staff remotely. Let's talk about that first. Okay. More than half of U.S. companies have hired new staff remotely. Now, a lot of companies were putting that off. They were just going to work with what they've got and not hire because, hey, it's hard to hire people remotely. But after a certain point, you got to fill those roles. So that has forced a lot of companies that never would have hired remotely before to do so. So there's a uh, survey out from Robert Half, the staffing company, that compares practices before the pandemic with those since the pandemic started. 75% of companies conducted remote interviews and onboarding sessions during the pandemic. Before the pandemic, only 12% did that. So 63% more have started doing that since the pandemic started. That's a huge jump in doing remote interviews and onboarding sessions. 61% of companies advertise fully remote jobs. That's up from 12% to another 49% added. Half of companies never advertise fully remote jobs and are now doing that during the pandemic. 60% of companies are expanding their searches geographically to access a wider candidate pool. Only 16% did that previously. Another 44% are now doing it. Hiring process has been shortened. 60% say that. And the use of temporary professionals has increased as well. That's up 14% did that previously with another 43% now doing it for a total of 57% of companies using or having increased the use of temporary professionals. So some big changes, right, in the hiring practices of businesses, now using remote people, hiring people remotely, doing remote interviews. I think a lot of this is going to stick even when we reopen the office. You know, if you've hired people remotely, it's not like you can ask them to now relocate. It's going to be interesting to see how, like, even if I look at what we're doing at here at Melio, right? I started. I had an in-person interview um, and then everything got shut down the week following that. And I think I was employee about 35. I think Melio now has 160 employees. So the vast majority of the company was hired virtually through, you know, Zoom, if you want to say, for lack of a better yeah. term, right? And it's going to be, it'll be interesting to see how different companies that hired majority of their people through this virtual way and how they work that way, et cetera, versus kind of traditional companies that are now adopting this as a hiring standard and how it affects the culture long term, I have no idea. But I imagine though, for starters though, since we're in this remote work world, that if somebody can't successfully navigate the interview process or an onboarding process, they're probably not going to be a good candidate to work remotely anyway. So in a way, it, in a way, the process is going to vet people out yep. how they're going to work in this new world. Well, it is, it is a great way to vet people. Like if they can't figure out how to get on your Zoom call, then that's disqualifying. <laughs> That's that's an interview question right there. So I have another stat about whether or not people plan to relocate. It makes sense. If people are able to work remotely, why would they live in an expensive place uh, in a big city where they used to have to live because they had to commute to an office? So according to Upwork, a survey of 20,000 Americans over the age of 18 conducted in the first half of October by Upwork, the company that specializes in helping businesses hire part and full-time remote employees and manage them. A whopping 14 million to 23 million Americans are planning to relocate to a new U.S. city or region 
due in part to the growing acceptance of remote work. That is a humongous number of people. Now, they're just saying they plan to. That doesn't mean they actually you know, have done it yet. But even if a fraction of those people relocate, that could be huge demographic shifts in this country uh, and could change the future of the workforce because now those people are going to want to work remotely for the rest of their careers. 20.6% of residents of major cities are planning to move beyond normal commuting distances. The majority, 54.7%, they want to relocate over two hours away or more from their current location. So that means they expect that remote work is going to be a permanent option for them in the long term. So this is great for firms that are already operating remotely for companies that are already able to work with remote people, because now you're going to have a much bigger pool of high quality remote workers. And the top 10 remote jobs that are now in high demand, computer and mathematical occupations are number one, but right after that, business and financial operations occupations. Over half of people in that field, that general field, worked remotely during the COVID-19 pandemic. People are just like, I think if you're used to it, you're not going to want to go back. Oh, but I, I'm also yeah. kind of missing, like, I, and it's weird, right? I've worked remotely for years, pre COVID, for a decade. I pretty much worked remotely, but having the option to fly in, go to an office, hang out with coworkers for a week is amazing. And like, that is currently is not possible. Well, and I, I agree with you. I love that option. And that's what I want. I want to work remotely the rest of my life, but I want to be able to go to the airport, fly to San Francisco and hang out with my colleagues once a month, maybe twice a month. I mean, I see them a lot at conferences anyway, right? And once that gets happening again, right, then you get that need for human interaction satisfied, right? That's how you used to get it, right, David? I mean, working remotely. Yeah, conferences and then going to yeah. the headquarters and, and yeah. seeing people. But yeah, I actually uh, finally met um, somebody here in Tucson. We had a beer together that it was nice to actually talk to somebody in the, in the industry and just have a beer. It was kind of, you know, and talk yeah. QuickBooks. It's kind of, uh, I just, you miss that, that face-to-face. -face. I and mean, even, even our, ourselves, we're in the same state and we're not even connecting, right? Like, yeah. maybe I should drive up and we should have a beer. I mean, we're, we're arguably in the same metro area by some standards, right? Tucson and Phoenix are not that far apart. Yeah, depending on, yeah, they're, they're almost touching now. It's turning yeah. into a big, uh, big facility. Should we get into app news? I have lots of tabs open. Uh, nothing super big, but there's a theme. I do have a theme here. Yeah, let's make app news. We do have app news. So let's get into it before we run out of time. I've got about six and we can work backwards through the headlines. Um, I've got six or seven that are all related to banks providing more services for small business owners and getting more in bed with apps and the march to have their own GLs. Like the next two years, three years, Quick, QuickBooks and Zero are not competing against each other. They're competing. It's it's QuickBooks versus the world, right? Or Zero versus the world of of you know banking. banks, yeah, banks and other new apps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I'll just quickly go through a lot of these. So, the Bank of New Zealand uh, renewed their contract with Nine Spokes. Nine Spokes is kind of like this dashboard platform for small and medium sized businesses, mm -hmm. but but the Bank of New Zealand white labels it and provides it as a tool, innovative tool for their SMB customers. So the, there's a bank offering accounting like software. Bluevine, so Bluevine, um, they previously were in that loan space, invoice refactoring space, and now they've rolled out their bank. And now they've completely, um, they've been rolling it out over the last year, but now they've completely unwrapped it. Now anybody can sign up and get this bank account. And it it's full service, right? You can get your dashboard, deposit your checks, transfer funds. You can pay your bills on their bill, uh, vendor payments, right? Uh, they have two or twenty thousand small business owners have already taken out bank accounts at Bluevine since they uh, piloted last October, and they're paying a one point a one percent interest rate on balances above a thousand, and they already have fifty million dollars in deposits. So now here's an app becoming a bank, right? Um, and then you have some other ones. So do you remember Lendio? Yeah, we talked about that once on the, or twice on the show. So they're like a small business lender. They're in that same space as the Cabbages and Ondex, right? They were in that mm -hmm. space. Well, they they purchased a company called Sunrise. And Sunrise was like a bookkeeping software app. And now they've re-released this as called Sunrise Invoices and Payments. And you can get this app now. And it collects payments, as manages invoices, organizes receipts. You can do your credit card payments and catalog expenses. Basically, it's a small little GL product. But it's presented from a bank. It's a and Lendio, in a weird way, is they're a loan company. They're a bank, 
Right. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, a lender becoming a bank is makes a lot of sense because that's one of the major functions of a bank to do. Yeah. So and, and they they uh, and Sunrise has other strategic partners, including WePay, who was purchased by J.P. Morgan Chase. And remember, we talked about uh, Chase last week about because they launched their new thing called Quick Accept. Yes, they're getting into credit card processing yes. for small businesses like Square. Yeah, and so Quick Accept apparently was built on their payment gateway, WePay. So they acquired WePay a few years ago. Mm-hmm. So now they're finally building this out. But there's an article. This article was uh, on payments.com. The CEO of Merchant Services, he starts to talk about how this is going beyond the payment itself. And they want to essentially provide a well-rounded FinServe offering to small businesses that function together as a one-stop shop. So if you're, if you're, if you're the bank and you want to offer a one-stop shop, what are you going to provide them? A GL eventually, right? Mm-hmm. You're not going to want them to ever leave. They're going to do everything under your roof. And so that, that ties back into that. JP Morgan's getting into this game. Um, and then Stripe, uh, I don't know if you knew this or not. So Stripe's going after Square a little bit more. Yep. So Stripe, a lot of people, a lot of people use Stripe, but they don't use Stripe. A lot of times you'll use an app on a website and you'll pay for something and you'll be using Stripe and not even know it. Yeah. But out in the field, it's very obvious when you're using Square, right? As a consumer. You, know, you people swipe their your credit card through the dongle. They got the little tap thing. So Square has announced that they have a deeper partnership with MindBody and MindBody's niche niche software for fitness studios, yoga gyms, yoga studios, etc. And they are now are going to not just power the website part of it. They're putting out Stripe terminals inside the brick and mortar studios. So did you and know that Stripe had hard hardware? I remember that they got into this game, but it's very small at this point still. So. So that's interesting. So they're partnering with MindBody to create a hardware plus practice management or fitness studio management software bundled with credit card processing for these franchises. Yeah. So I'll keep my eye out on this because I use, I know Orange Theory Fitness, who I go to every day, they yeah. use MindBody. So I'll keep an eye on and see if this hardware shows up yeah. at the uh, my Orange Theory location. So, you know, or they're had now, you know, Stripe's competing with Square, and then you have Square was in the news. Yes, uh, are you talking about the Credit Karma news? Credit Karma news, yes. Yeah. So, so Credit Karma is in talks, according to the Wall Street Journal, uh, to sell its tax preparation business to Square of all companies, and apparently this is to avoid those antitrust concerns with the acquisition by Intuit. Intuit is buying Credit Karma or wants to. And the Justice Department is a little skeptical of that because Intuit, obviously the maker of TurboTax, is humongous in the self-tax prep category. And Credit Karma has a competing free product. So the question is, is Intuit trying to buy Credit Karma to crush its competition and reduce choice in the marketplace? So if Credit Karma can sell its tax prep software to Square, then they can potentially avoid that issue. And that would be really interesting because Square is doing so much for small businesses now. They are really becoming the solution provider of not just your point of sale and your credit card processing, but also your payroll, your scheduling, your website. If they did tax prep too, I wouldn't be surprised if they started doing that general ledger thing that you've been talking about for a long time, David. Yeah. The collision of all of these coming together is just getting faster and faster. And what's interesting about Square is Square has both sides of the fence. And just like Intuit does, right? Intuit has a large amount of consumers that use their products mm-hmm. and they have the employees through payroll and they have the small business owners. And I, I really look at Square as like they have kind of the very similar base for that. So yeah, if Square adds a GL and they add tax, Square's Square and Intuit are pretty much the same company from a you know a number standpoint of yeah. their their what they their reach. Very interesting. I've got some QuickBooks news. So QuickBooks, just like Square, is extending its tentacles into some seemingly everything that a small business owner could need. And they have now released QuickBooks Insurance. It's a way for QuickBooks users to find in the app affordable coverage tailored to the unique needs of small businesses. And it looks like they have partnered with AP. I was just going to that was going to be my guess. Yes. Intego. Is that what it's called? I forget, you know, 
the name of it exactly but yeah and and i've I've always told them i'm like you can't call it ap like it throws everybody (laughs) off every first time you see them at a conference you go up to their booth you think it's going to be accounts payable related software no it's not it's it's insurance insurance so in the screenshot uh, they don't talk about like the specific types of insurance you can get but business owner policies are in there general liability get a quote i imagine workers comp of course would be in there too Uh, so easy way for quickbooks users to you know get a quote and just probably fill out those applications using the data that's already in their QuickBooks or their QuickBooks payroll or whatever. There's also a new Salesforce connector by QuickBooks. So there have been Salesforce connectors in the past, but this is the one that's it's, built. QuickBooks by... is trying this again. This, this will be the third time now <laughs> oh, into it. Let's is see it how really? This What's the history on this, David? <laughs> they built it themselves before. Two years later, like small businesses don't really want to eat. QuickBooks users don't really want sales uh, QuickBooks or Salesforce connections. Um, I think they tried to have third parties build it for them before. It's just been this like dance. So I guess the, <laughs> the third time's a charm this time. Well, we'll see. It's, uh, you know, it's hard to do. I mean, Salesforce is a complicated application. And I think part of the problem is that everybody customizes their Salesforce. Yep. So to get stuff to come in correctly and to sync properly can be a real challenge, I imagine. Reclassify Transactions is now available in QuickBooks Online Advance for non-accountants. It used to only be available in QuickBooks Online Accountants. Now, regular users in Online Advanced, the other QBOA, which is not confusing at all, can do the batch reclassify transactions. Uh, One more piece of QuickBooks news. There is now a Power BI connector in the QuickBooks Marketplace. So if you're using Microsoft Power BI for dashboards and reports, you can now connect your QuickBooks and get that data brought in automatically. And that's another rehash. I feel like like that that happened once before. <laughs> now it's back five years. Every, Let's everything old again, is right? new again. Yes. Last bit of app news, not QuickBooks. Walters Kluwer has added e-signature to ATX professional tax software. So now you don't have to print out tax returns and taxpayers can sign documents from anywhere. So about time, right? That's pretty great. And uh, I think that's it. I've got, it's all like, oh no, one more, uh, more antitrust scrutiny. The government really is on this antitrust thing, right? With Google and Intuit and Plaid and Visa now. So Visa, we have reported in the past is trying to buy Plaid. And the government on Tuesday filed a petition with the U.S. District Court in Massachusetts asking the consulting firm Bain & Co. to turn over documents wanted as part of an antitrust review. They want to know what Visa strategies are around pricing and competition with other debit card networks. So yeah, they're investigating this. And it's interesting, I saw an article where they actually talked about how Britain's Competition and Market Authority, their CMA, they gave the green light for the acquisition already. Hmm. And what's interesting, they had that, so that's, so that's a watchdog group, right? And they said that there's a number, the, the reasoning was that it's not really a threat because there's a number of providers already doing this and they're active in the UK. And so they actually named them. They named TrueLayer, Yappily, Tink, Token.io, as other companies already processing similar or stronger competitive capabilities than Plaid. And I'm not like, Considering like we're pretty deep in the space and I've never heard of any of those four companies, I would probably have to disagree that they are similar, stronger, or competitive. Well, you know what? They might be in the UK because they have only a few banks in the UK. And so it's it would be easy to start a company to compete with Plaid there because you only have to build a few different connections. Which is crazy because the UK is they're going to open banking, right? Where none of these companies might even need to exist in the future. But I just find like it just feels like this kind it almost feels like it's just interesting, like over here on the US side, like we're scrutinizing this and it makes sense to scrutinize it, right? Plaid's a, they have a lot of data and Visa having control over that's very interesting. But to, to say like there's other companies, like Plaid's just one of many companies doing this, I don't think it's true. Like Plaid is like, this, this game was won by Plaid. In the US for sure. One last bit of information. I keep saying I'm done, but then I keep finding new stuff. I still have two more as well. So. <laughs> All right. So right. I'll do my last one. So FreshBooks now supports Invoice attachments. You can now attach any files you want, including designs and timesheets directly to an invoice. This allows you to keep all documents related to a particular invoice organized in one place. And what do you got to finish things out here? Two, two payroll ones will wrap up and then at one Amazon one. So we've talked about like daily pay, active pay, these ways for employees to get paid instantly. I think Gusto rolled something out, right? Mm-hmm. Well, ADP is rolling something out now, their own app. So even though you could get apps like this in the ADP's marketplace, so ADP is going to roll out their own and they're really rolling it out as a separate financial wellness app. 
ADPs now are going to really get into that if you think about it, like the Quicken, the uh, Mint, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you need a budget, that personal finances space. And, and it, it makes a lot of sense. I remember when I did View My Paycheck years and years and years ago, the number one piece of feedback we always got was when people are viewing their pay stub, they want to do budgets. And we used to get asked this all the time, like, how do we do a budget? Well, at that time, you just send them over to Quicken and they're like, hey, go use Quicken or Mint, right? That mm-hmm. could be your, your solution. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so... ADP is coming into that space. Uh, are you familiar with Workday? Uh, yeah. I mean, in the large sense, right? They're enterprise software way up there with Oracle, SAP. Yeah. And they were really uh, heavily more um, people management before, mm-hmm. HR, payroll, et cetera. Well, they're now announcing a GL. They're going to have the Workday Accounting Center. Really? Interesting. And that's going to tie into their newly launched Workday Adaptive Planning, which is... Uh, Machine they learning acquired. driven reports and forecasts. Yeah, and that's from Adaptive Insights. They acquired Adaptive Insights, the FPA software up in the uh, enterprise space. So they're, they're really becoming a full stack solution. Yeah. And so then the last one is like, I think I was thinking back to our predictions episode, and we I think we covered like other people's predictions. And one of them was other companies getting into our space. Like Netflix could do payroll since mm-hmm. they, they have to, pay, they're doing production, movie production. They have, tens of thousands of employees, hundreds of thousands of employees that they have to pay. And they could build their own payroll software if they wanted, right? Well, Amazon, so you know that Amazon had those little dash buttons you could get, put it by, and so every time you ran out of your Tide, you press the button and it would order you another box of Tide, tide detergent to do your laundry. Remember those <laughs> yes. dash buttons? Yes. Okay. And then they have their subscribe and sit save, right? You could just subscribe to products. Well, what they've done is they have a new system for small business owners. And it's to uh, control inventory ordering. It's called Dash Smart Shelf. And so the way this works is it's like a scale you put on your shelf. And it's really not for the inventory you're going to sell, per se. It's going to be for your supplies cabinet. So the post notes and the pens and toilet paper and all those things you need to auto-replenish at your business. So, so basically, you get this scale. You put it on your shelf. And then you put on your toilet paper and your, paper, uh, your pens and your post notes. And then as you use these products the weight of the scale is going to change and Amazon's going to automatically ship you your new products. Oh, that's so cool. And it knows by the weight that it decreases what you took, probably what you took off the shelf. Yes. And so, wow. and, and this is really designed at small businesses because larger, huge operations have things like this, but they have very expensive machines doing it for industrial use. But here's the, int- so where this is coming back is Amazon is doing a lot with small businesses. A lot of the resellers are small businesses. They have all the sales data. They easily could add a GL if they want, right? Now, they could easily get into the inventory game. And this is very realistic. At the QuickBooks Connect hackathons, we brought in different technologies people could build things with. And I think we had some scale. There's a scale type thing, some smart scale. And people at the hackathon event built something to do the same thing with inventory. So if you just take this out of your supplies cabinet, there's no reason this technology... Amazon can't get into the true inventory game of the of the inventory of your business. I mean, a lot of businesses already let Amazon handle everything from inventory to fulfillment, right? They, all they do is have a website at this point. So there's even uh, systems that Amazon sells now. They're developing for grocery stores and, and you can basically buy this like entire warehouse in a box machine where this is coming out. Uh, you you just feed products into it and Amazon tags them, warehouses them in this giant machine that you put in the back of your store. And then when you need the products, you come, you touch a screen, you grab them, take them out. It's like a giant vending machine. I, I think we talked about this in the past sometime earlier this year, this whole like just how Amazon got good at running servers and they ran, then they spun up AWS and yeah. then they got good at shipping and now they have their own shipping. Right, the kind of this retails a service where you're going to, instead of Target figuring out how to do this, all this themselves, they'll just run on Amazon stack. Mm-hmm. Their, their warehouse will be ran on Amazon stack. Their yep. distribution will be their point of sales. Everything will be ran on an Amazon stack of retail. It's going to be everything as a service. They're, they're just, just figuring out how to optimize all of these processes. It's really incredible. Yeah. Uh, well, before we go, David, we have a voicemail from Heather Smith, who I like to think of as our Australian correspondent. And she, correspondent. Is, <laughs> yeah, she is answering a question for you, David. I think this was a question you had about zero and open banking that you posited. Oh, yes. I wasn't sure about it. I, I think I called out into it for announcing they were the first partner ever with open banking or something. So let's hear what uh, Heather has to say here. 
G'day David and Blake, it's Heather Smith here from the Cloud Stories podcast and your favourite Australian correspondent. Uh, In your podcast episode released on October 22nd, you asked why was Xero not accredited for open banking with the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission? Um, And I went to the horse's mouth. I contacted Xero and asked them about this. I spoke with Mark Peard, who's Head of Market Development Partnerships at Australia and New Zealand. And his response was, this is uh, me reading out verbatim, As a background, a few years ago, we made the decision to certify the Xero platform under the ATO, so that's the Australian Taxation Office Operational Framework. In recent updates to the Open Banking Accreditation Rules, we'll likely have the option to be automatically accredited as a data recipient as part of our annual compliance review under the ATO DSP Operational Framework. As you know, our customers already benefit from our existing bank feed services and we continue to work with financial institutions to increase access to data for our customers. Full stop. So I think it's about a matter of uh, there was potentially sort of different routes to get the same outcome there and uh, uh, they went another way. So hopefully that was useful for you. Thank you for uh, a great podcast, guys. That was great. Thank you, Heather. I've learned something. So it was, Zero had their own kind of certification through the ATO, and they just the cycle didn't come around for them to be reviewed by this other agency yet. And QuickBridge just got reviewed first, so they got the the sticker first. Interesting. Uh, we would never would have figured that out without you. So thanks, Heather. Any reviews this week, David? We did get one review. Do you want to read that? The headline is: I never miss a weekly podcast. These are so great. Five stars. I usually find myself laughing or saying yep at some point in each podcast. Most recently in your podcast discussing Zoom, you suggested the future may look different in office settings and suggested companies setting up space just for Zoom meetings for individuals that don't have access otherwise. That idea is genius for firms with aging and non-tech savvy clients if they want to keep those clients. I never miss a podcast. This is my weekly rundown on what's happening. Thank you for your news, insights, and suggestions. That is from Chan Collab via Apple Podcasts in the United States of America. Thanks so much, Chan. Really appreciate you listening and your feedback. Uh, I always love hearing from our listeners when something speaks to them, when they find a piece of advice interesting or a particular news story interesting. So if you want to write a review, David, where's the best place for people to go? If you're an Apple person, you can go to Apple Podcast, and it really helps people discover the podcast. Uh, the reviews are very important there. And then if you're a non-Apple Podcast, you can go to podchaser.com and leave reviews on that website. And that, that shows up in other players now. And if you feel especially brave, you are welcome to call us and leave us a message. We have a voicemail number set up. The number is 202-695-1040. Call that number. It's a Google voice number. Go straight to voicemail. You can leave us a message. Try to keep it to around one minute. We will play the message uh, and listen to it. And we might even put it on the show. We will likely put it on the show. So we always love hearing from our listeners. If you have any opinions, uh, any thoughts, any tips for our listeners, something that's worked for you, something that you particularly liked, we just like hearing from you. It's a great way to stay in touch in these COVID times. And if you want to connect with me online, I am at Blake T. Oliver. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, just say, I'm not a bot. David, how about you? I'm everywhere. Just you can find David Leary. I'm on Twitter at David Leary. I'm on LinkedIn at David Leary. I've been thinking about this not a bot. Now that a lot of people are doing this not a bot thing, like if you're a LinkedIn spammer, you could just start doing this. I'm not a bot. And then I'm going to fall for it. Well, you're giving away the secrets, David. Hopefully, you don't get spammed by a bunch of people. But I do because the LinkedIn spammers, you know when they spam me, you know what I reply to them? You I, send them- I, I send them a link to the podcast. I said, you'll love this podcast. And I send them a link to the podcast every single time I get a LinkedIn spam. That's great. So they're all listening. That. They're all listeners it's, now. It's reverse spam. Thanks, everyone, for listening, David. I'll see you here next week. Bye, everybody. Time for the classifieds. I want to tell you about a new workflow solution called Bakotech. Bakotech is a cloud solution that puts CPAs in the middle of their clients' data. 
BakuTech gathers clients' data and delivers it to CPAs in real time through one login, enabling CPAs to make adjustments to tax returns and client accounting issues as they happen, not at for year end. BakuTech helps CPAs provide their clients with the proactive services they need and increases the firm's efficiency and leads to working less overtime and busy season. To learn more about BakuTech, head over to bakuTech.com. Looking to radically increase productivity as a cloud accountant? Introducing Client Hub's Frictionless Workflow, a unique combination of internal workflow seamlessly blended with client tasks and communications. See how a frictionless experience across your team and your clients will save you hours of time. Get started today with a free trial at clienthub.app. Enter promo code CAP25 for 25% off your first three months. Client Hub, truly frictionless workflow. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info, and be sure to check out our special stimulus pricing of four episodes for just $100.